and welcome to the JSGS Public Lecture, Traditional Indigenous Governance in Contemporary Society. It's being presented by Marilyn Putra, Vice President of Indigenous Governance at the Institute of Governance. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Cassandra Opikikiwajunta, and I am a PhD candidate here at JSGS, as well as Associate Director at the Indigenous Peoples Health Research Centre. I'll be the moderator for today's events. And as many of you know, we are one school with two campuses, so I want to extend a very warm welcome to our colleagues and guests at the University of Saskatchewan, where the event will be moderated by Dion Polar. Uh, I must confess, I am a Maryland groupie, or a fan if there is such a thing. I actually had the pleasure of meeting her about six years ago when I was a law student at the University of Saskatchewan. I was taking her summer property law class. Her engaging teaching style actually made personal property law interesting. I was immediately in awe of her brilliance and her humility. I was also a little bit scared because she is very intimidating. <laughs> After all, what do you say to someone with a Master of Laws from Harvard? <laughs> However, as I'm sure you'll see today, despite all she has accomplished, Marilyn manages to stay grounded as she navigates between the Indigenous and non-Indigenous worlds. Now working at the IOG, Marilyn's purpose is to bring a common understanding of governance principles through executive education, research, and advising. She has also worked in, in, in Indigenous law and governance as an assistant professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Saskatchewan. Her expertise is in constitutional and Aboriginal law, with a life study of customary laws. She has also developed a number of legal education initiatives and has significant experience in the development of self-government. Given this background and the signal from our current federal government to forge a new relationship with Indigenous peoples, it is particularly timely to have Marilyn here today to talk about what it could mean to institutionalize traditional principles of Indigenous governance in our modern governance processes. Following the talk, we will entertain questions, but for now, please join me in welcoming the fabulous Marilyn Patra. Thank you so much for what a wonderful welcome. I, um, I've been teaching. I've been teaching for a long time, and. I will say without hesitation, the highest form of flattery is when somebody that you've taught comes back and says that they enjoyed being with you and learning with you and, and enjoyed your teaching. So I, that really means a lot to me. Thank you so much. So I'm going to try to make eye contact with everybody so that Saskatoon feels welcome. I've actually never done this sort of thing before. So hello and hello. Uh, Tanse. I am a little bit nervous. I'm a little bit nervous because I care a lot about what I'm about to talk to you about. This truly is the thing in my life that has kept me in the area that I'm in, law. I've tried to leave law many times. And this is the thing that brings me back every single time. So I care intensely about the topic that we've chosen to talk about together today. I want to say, uh, Kinanaskumun itnao to Johnson Shoyama for inviting me here and for you to come out and listen. I'm going to try my Cree on, and so for those of you who speak Cree, I'm going to throw a few words out there today. If I say it badly, please come later and tell me I could I could do better. But I I have an aspiration to speak Cree and to speak Machif, and I I don't practice publicly enough, so I'm making an effort here. <coughs> So, uh, as noted on the poster and in my introduction, you've heard, hmm, maybe I could do this. That I'm going to talk about traditional governance today. Nope, that's not going to work. Sorry, I got to use my notes. I don't, I don't typically do this, so I'm worried about running out past the time, so I'm trying to stick to what I said I was going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk about traditional governance today in terms of traditional Indigenous governance. I want to reflect our ongoing interest, our Indigenous people's ongoing interest, 
in participating in the governance of this land and to say we actually bring something to the table. To say that um, our traditional values are ones that not only could be integrated into the Canadian government system, but should be. I was inspired to speak about this as a topic, not only because it's my passion, not only because, you know, I think everybody has something that they would skip dinner for, something that they would do that you would give up a whole bunch of things, this is it. Working with elders, working in community, this is it for me. That's my thing. But there's more, it's more to it than that. If you've been listening at all to what's going on politically in our country, Indigenous is the new black. Okay? And I'm really, really excited about that. I think it's time and I think it's something we should be celebrating because it doesn't happen very often. You know, I'm only one generation removed from a family who um, my father, because he's, he's Machif, didn't have to go to residential school. He's a road allowance half-breed from near Katepa Valley. He didn't have to go to residential school and when he went to school in grade one, he, his story is um, he went running home to his mom and he was like the baby, the favorite, and he went running home and said, I don't want to go to school, it's not very fun there. And his mom said, my, my cook um said to him, oh, you don't have to, my boy, you can stay home. So my dad didn't have to be institutionalized. And, and he went on to own his own construction company and he's been the foreman on lots of job sites and he's still the handyman around town in the community where he lives with my mom um, in Indian Head, Saskatchewan. So, um, he grew up at a time when it, what, it, Indigenous was not the new black, right? It wasn't cool. It wasn't something, I don't speak Machif because my father didn't think it, he should pass it on to me. It wasn't going to be something that would be good for me to have. And so to be in a time when we're, being, we're, we're receiving the messages that we're receiving is really, really important. You can tune into almost any media source, social media, television, newspapers, and you will hear, um, you will hear local elections talking about how to include Indigenous people. That's really important. That's really, really great. So I want to celebrate those kinds of things. Um, you can see there's stats on employment. There's information on environmental and international development issues that include an Indigenous voice. You will see us in government. You will see us as clerks and tellers. You will see us as servers. You will see us as cooks. You'll see us in med school and law school. You'll find us in engineering schools now. You'll see us all over the place. So we're, we're finding that there's a rhythm. There's a rhythm to the inclusion of Indigenous people. Indigenous voice has a place in the choir, and I want to celebrate that. But I also want to be really clear that this isn't new for us. The celebration is new, but we've been part of this all along. We've tried out for the choir many, many times, okay? We've signed treaties to be included. We've created legitimate provisional governments to be included. We've gone to war to be included. We've fought to be included. We've died to be included. We've gone to school to be included. This feels a little bit like Big Brother. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've followed English and Canadian law to be included. We've litigated to be included. We've negotiated to be included. We've gone to the Privy Council to be included. We've participated in United Nations forums to be included. We've taken every option available to us to sing our song of inclusion, participation, and to, par to repair our relationship and to bring our song to the nation stage. But now, if you really listen, you are also going to hear that inclusion. You're going to hear the hum, the rhythm of the voice of Indigenous people, and it's being encouraged to be included. The efforts that our ancestors have made have been absolutely worth it. Music, I think, is a good metaphor for what is happening right now. Music is 
a good way to think about the inclusion of, of Indigenous people, because everybody loves music, right? We all love a wide range of music, and it can be appreciated a cappella. It can be appreciated solo. It can be appreciated with backup. It can be a four-part harmony, and it can be a choir. So I really like the metaphor of using music as a way to see that Indigenous people, voice, ideas, traditions are and can be included. Of course, Indigenous people have also been included in the workplace for a very long time. I personally come from a long line of cooks, cleaners, and construction workers. We've had skilled laborers, inventors. We've had singers, artists, sharpshooters, military people, Army, Navy, Air Force, veterans. Indigenous people have had scouts. We've had translators, harvesters, historians, midwives, leaders, designers, seamstresses, pharmacologists, astronomers, teachers, physicists, healers, engineers, ceremonialists, hunters, contrarians, and a lot more since time immemorial. So what we're bringing isn't actually new, <coughs> but the way we're trying to be included and are being included is something, again, that I want to celebrate. So how do we know that this is happening? And that was in the, in the introduction, um, we can talk about what's happening with the promises of the new Trudeau government, right? We can see that if you look at the participation of Indigenous people in the last few elections, the most recent federal one is particularly interesting. And, and there, if you look back far enough, and for the, for the um, political wonks in the room and the people who look back at this statistically, you're going to have a, a better lens on this than I am, to look at the Saskatchewan example of Gary Morasti running for the Liberals a few elections ago. And, and it wasn't foreseen in any way that he would win that election, but the uh, First Nation that was in the riding had an uh, extraordinary number of voters that came out in that election, and it blew the doors off of that particular riding in a way that people hadn't anticipated. And so there's been, we've seen that this is coming and this is growing, right? Um, and we've seen it definitely with this, the, the most recent federal election. The federal election songbook, the speeches, the ministerial mandate letters, uh, you can pick up any one of those mandate letters, and I have looked at all of them, and you can find seeds in there about what are we going to do. The phrases of relationship building, partnerships, working on a nation-to-nation -nation basis, dominate what those ideas, ideals, or notions consist of, or should be, one would imagine we would try to define together. I want you to know that I think some people are not trying to define that together. It's the same thing that happened when we started talking about consultation. We're going to talk about the duty to consult, and in order to do that, every provincial government and several departments within the federal government shut their doors all the worker bees went inside, they put their heads down and they decided what a duty to consult policy would look like. And if you can't come up with a duty to consult by consulting, <laughs> we have a lot of work to do. And so um, that, that can't happen again. I think, I hope we've learned that nation to nation building doesn't mean you go figure out what that means at your house and I'll figure out what it means at my house and hopefully there's something that we can be copacetic later. I hope that's not what we're doing. But our history uh, has little evidence that we are going to be working together. So if that does happen, it will be inevitable from a process where we try to design that, that relationship, that new relationships will be forged and the very nature of being in conversation is what will spur those new relationships. And it's possible. It's probable and possible and highly likely because we have so many places where conversations need to happen. And so I think good things can come from that. We're heading into a, a provincial election. What will happen on the provincial uh, election in terms of inclusion? I'm wondering. We'll see what that's going to look like because you're never really very sexy at home. You're kind of like the neighbor. And in the federal election, Indigenous people could be seen as more or less, more exotic than less exotic because the federal governments were really vying for positions all over the place. And so it wasn't really at home. It was traveling across the country and moving out of sort of Ottawa Central to see what could this possibly look like. 
Um, but we're locals to provincial governments, and we're actually typically non-voting locals. And the price of paying attention to politically indigenous voice has been minimal for politicians in the provincial level. Organized political activism on several indigenous fronts has been there, but if it's noteworthy within the current media or at the legislature, it's, a very, it's got a very short shelf life, okay? So it's not something that lasts for a long time and the issues are often minimized and we need to also build relationships within the media to ensure that those kinds of things stay alive. Um, we don't want to be a democratic bother, we want to be a democratic participant. But now Indigenous people are voting, moving into the space of retiring baby boomers, taking up space in mainstream education and the current historic treatment of Canadian Indigenous people. We're gaining support from neighbours and from our families and we're gaining strength. It's our own engagement really. It's our decision to engage at every level that's helped grow this. It's the little partnerships that have been growing all the way along that are helping this. It's reshaping the songs that we're singing with other people in the choir. Today, with Indigenous people engaged in all systems, healthcare system, wealth creation, the education system, the justice system, social systems, and now we're going to be growing into the political arena as well. Requests for inclusion for more than just the customers will be at the level of political par participation. And so if any of you were paying attention at the federal election, you're going to know that it was a really debatable topic in terms of our own communities. Should we vote? Shouldn't we vote? Are those, those are not our systems. The agreements that we have is this is our government, we'll run our things, you run your things. And, and I've, worked with, I've worked with chiefs who are, are absolute um, mentors to me, the late, um, the late chief from Ochapaways, um, was one of the ones that had the most profound impact on me in terms of saying we had a deal that we weren't going to participate in non-indigenous governance systems. That was the deal that we made. And so his father told him, you can't go vote. So he never voted in the political systems of the non-indigenous people. But I read this really great article that said, so we'll participate in the justice system and we'll participate in the health system, we'll participate in the social work system, but we won't participate in the political system. And I think those kinds of conversations have had a really huge impact in terms of what happened. So are we there yet? Hmm, are we there yet? Let's think about where we are right now. We have a Kwakwal woman that is a Pacific Northwest Coast Indigenous person that's the Attorney General of Canada. That's pretty awesome. That is pretty amazing. That sounds almost like an African American could run for pre President of the United States. Like, we're starting to take over pretty significant power positions. I've been speaking with some of the people from the Department of Justice in Ottawa about what it is like to work with somebody like Jody, and they say, <coughs> it's been amazing. It's a minister that you don't have to sit down and debrief every single statistic about what's happening in the correctional system, what's happening with Indigenous people, what's happening with women. You don't have to brief her on that stuff because she's been living it and she knows it and she's been working in the area. It's, it's her life. And so there's lots of great conversations that don't have to start from page one, which is really important too. Our demographic spike is something else that we have to think about. So we know that Indigenous population is on the rise. We know that it's hitting the range where the political Richter scale is starting to vibrate to go, whoa, what's going on here? There's a lot of Indigenous people that are going to be showing up and by whatever year, 2030, what's the population going to be and what are, what are those people going to be doing? So if you listen, you'll hear our hum, you'll hear our voice in the choir, the political choir, the employment choir, the academic choir, the access to justice choir, and the environmental choir, just to name a few. Now this matters not just because there's a lot of us and we're going to add numbers to that kind of choir. It matters <coughs> because there's a breadth and depth that we will add as well. 
that we, our pitch, our tone will add dimension, our history will add new songs for the songbook and new instruments for the backup. And I want to be clear, I believe that Indigenous inclusion at every level is a value-added opportunity. So what do we add? What do we add? I was just asked yesterday in a meeting at the IOG about what we're going to do with Indigenous participation. How, how's this going to work? What's it going to look like? Is there really anything left? Like, do you really have those ceremonies anymore? Like, what's sort of left of governance, okay? Does it exist? Well, of course it does. Of course it still exists. Of course it evolved, just like everybody else's systems evolve. Of course, you know, our clothing is different. Of course the way we cook our food, the houses we live in are different, just like yours are, right? Just like non-Indigenous people's systems evolve, so do Indigenous people's systems. Sometimes for good, and sometimes not so good. We have to learn. It's choice. It's a choice of how we choose our leadership. It's a choice of how our issues take priority. It's a choice of how we treat the women who are the caregivers and creators in society. It's a choice. But I want to take a little bit of break from my lecture right now, and I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about tradition and whether it matters and how it matters. I'm going to tell you a story about looking for identity. And I call my story Eddie's Quest. Eddie was curious, as curious could be. He looked and he searched. He wanted to see. He hunted in cupboards and hunted in drawers. He hunted in plant pots and under rugs on the floors. Kigwai and Totaman, his kukum would say. Namoya kota kitsia seteo. What are you looking for, his grandma would share. Your little belly button is simply not there. Eddie continued on in his search. He looked from morn till night. He went through the entire house. He opened everything in sight. He found pots, he found pans, he found lids, and he found cans. Kigwai and Totaman, his cookum would say. Namoya kota kitsiteo este kitsi esiteo. What are you looking for? His grandma would share. Your little belly button is simply not there. Through each of the rooms, Eddie looked with such care. He looked on the sofa and under the chair. He looked through the windows and inside every nook. He was searching for something no matter what it took. At the end of the day, with his looking all done, Eddie would sleep and dream of his fun. He dreamed of his quest and of all that he found. Then he'd wake up and start looking around. Kigwa and Totaman, his kukum would say. Namoya kota kitsi eseteo. What are you looking for, his grandma would share. Your little belly button is simply not there. So my little story is something that you might hear someone tell a child. But if you start to listen and you start to dissect what you've heard and about the significance, the first thing you might say is, what's the belly button about? And the second thing you might say is, cook them. There's a cookum in there. And the third thing you might say is, it's looking all over the place. What's going on with that? It is significant. She's telling him, you're looking for yourself. Your belly button didn't get proper care, and now you're looking everywhere for it. What's going on with your belly button? It's not in there, honey. Go look someplace else. It's not in there either. And these stories are really, really significant. Traditionally, there was ceremony from birth. There were processes for accepting that no new life form would, have, would come without ceremony. 
that the placenta and the belly button had a proper place and they played a role in the creation. There were laws about who could be with that child until the belly button cord actually fell off. Who would hold that child? There were rules about moss bags and the cord that held it together to represent that umbilical cord. There were laws about the beadwork that would go on that moss bag to teach that child what their name was because a name would come with that. There are laws for beadwork. I have a beater in my life that tells me when he was learning to bead as a child, he was learning from his mother, and when she would be beading, she would say, don't you touch my beads, because if you drop them and lose them, we'll lose somebody in our community. Don't you drop those beads. And if the beads did get dropped, they would spend all day on the floor looking for every bead. So there were laws for belly buttons. And like all laws, there were consequences for non-compliance. There were natural consequences. And one of them being that people would get lost. They would not know who they are, and they would have to go on a quest to find themselves. That's one Cree story. There's a story from the um, Gwich'in in the north that would sound a lot like that. It would sound a lot like a little kid digging through cupboards. It's such a good sign, they would say. Look at that little one digging through. She pulls all the boxes out. She dumps all the cereal. She does all that. That little one is born under the sign of a beaver. And they might actually go and get a strip of beaver tail and put it around that little girl's arm. And it would stay with her until it naturally fell off. And you want your baby born under the sign of a beaver. Beavers are industrious. Beavers take care of shelter. Beaver understand the cycle of trees. You want your babies born under the sign of a beaver. There's another story, and it's a Cree story, about naming and belly buttons and placenta. And when you take the placenta, and it, depending on where you're going to put it, your baby is going to be attached to that. So if you want an industrious baby, you might put that placenta on an anthill because lots of work is going to come. People, the, the community within the anthill, they know what their jobs are. And so we could have a naming ceremony around that. They sound like children's stories, but we've been hiding things in there for a very long time. One of the most basic forms of governance is self-government, literally, autonomy individual autonomy. And the elders that I work with tell me what's happening with our children is they don't know who they are. And they need to know who they are. And when you, t you break those bonds between the cookum in the story that's watching that baby, teaching that baby, guiding that baby, talking to that baby, and you break that, you lose part of your identity. And so how do you regain that? What happens with that? What's the role of that kukum? Your mother is your first teacher. Your grandmother is your second teacher. And if grandma is the midwife, she might actually be your first teacher. And so I've worked with male elders that say, makes me so angry when I see these university students. They're so giving and so respectful to their university professors. What about their first teacher? Do they honor their first teacher the way they honor their university professors? And so what is the role of that grandmother? What is her job? It's not just a babysitter. This person is going to understand completely who that baby is. And then, just like education programs in England and the programs in Quebec where you have to choose where you're going to go, China's got this too, I'm going to choose to go this way or this way, the grandmothers would meet and they would decide, this one is a historian. This one is an inventor. This one is a leader. This one's a warrior. And they would be put into these camps of where they were going to be and what their, what their gifts were, because they would be followed to understand what those gifts are. Old people want us to openly discuss and tell our children about being lost. 
they want their children to, they want our children to know who they are, and our, of course our children want to know who they are. So this is a point where I could sort of step off and get into a whole discussion about residential school and what happened with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and what happens when we were sort of child snatching our current sort of 60 scoop that's lasted into 2016 uh, and what's happening with that. But I'm not going to do that. I want to talk to you and I want you to, to understand that self-governance, knowing who you are as an individual, is one of the most important traditions. And so I was taught that individual learning is the most important because, because it's from here that you then go out into your family, into your community, and then into where our systems are, our systems, our processes, our government. Once, as an individual, you understand who you are and what your role is, once you are showing people you know how to look after yourself, you could feed yourself, you can make decisions, you can dress yourself, you can do those things. Then your responsibility, and it was always about responsibility, your responsibility would go to a family. What are you doing within the family? What's your responsibility within the family? And then out to your community <coughs> responsibilities. So although my talk is not a lecture about residential school and child snatching, and it's about the tradition of the most basic teaching of self-government that comes from something as basic as knowing what to do with the umbilical cord of a child, how that cord is represented throughout a child's life, the roles of the people around that child, those are their government. That is what government looks like when you're new. And to say traditionally, that's where government starts. That's where governance lies. It's the song of the individual. Traditional indigenous government is far more accessible than people realize. We often think, how would we get it? We've lost our ways. We've lost when elders pass on. We were talking this morning about losing libraries and what that means to lose somebody with so much knowledge and so much gifting. Um, it's true that we lose the people and the teachers in our lives, but the lessons from a traditional perspective are always available for us. And it's true for two funny reasons. It's true for one reason because colonization as an experiment has been very, very successful. I don't know if you've heard. And one of the side effects of colonization is that we're studied like crazy. Indigenous people are studied like crazy. Okay? We've got, we're not just studied for statistical purposes either, right? We're studied for recidivism rates, and we're studied for unemployment rates, and we're studied for the number of Indigenous children in care, and we're studied for all kinds of things, large, grand studies. We're studied for commissions, we're studied for reports, we're studied for polls, and we're studied for inquiries. We're always studied. We even had a royal commission. And the Royal Commission, that is now 20 years old, the Royal Commission had access to some pretty great thinkers, Indigenous and non, and 20 years ago, this is what they had to say about Indigenous or Aboriginal government. In most Aboriginal nations, political life has always been closely connected with the family, the land, and a strong sense of spirituality. In speaking to the Commission of their governance traditions, many Aboriginal people emphasize the integrated nature of the spiritual, family, economic, and political spheres. While some Canadians tend to see government as remote, divorced from people in everyday life, Aboriginal people generally view government in a more holistic way and as inseparable from the totality of the communal practice that make up a way of life. Words that you might hear in Saskatchewan are things like wakotuan, all my relations, pulling everybody in. Uh, if you study adoption, for example, the, the practice of adoption, customary adoption in an Indigenous community, it has nothing to do with ownership of people and their property and saying what happens to their property if something happens to them. And it has everything to do with responsibility. You can be adopted in our communities, in the Dene communities, in the Cree communities, in the Dakota communities here in Saskatchewan, all your life. 
my husband has three dads that have adopted him since his, da his, his birth father died, his adopted father died, and now he's got three men that call him their son. He's got women who adopt them as their sister. He has another woman that's about 89 right now that is pretty sure he should be her husband, but I'm trying to draw the line on that. <laughs> we adopt all the time at every age. And it's a way of saying, I have a responsibility for you. You are now actually part of my family, and I have a responsibility to you, and you can come to me. Bemozuan uh, is the Ojibwe word, and it's a way of life, the way we live, the way we come together. Now, the first glimpse that I ever had that um, indigenous laws were accessible was when I was working in the Arctic at, the Ar at Arctic College on a pre-law -pre program. We were developing a pre-law program up there. And it was um, maybe mid-1990s. I had taken, I had three children at the time, and I had taken them to the library at Arctic College to look at some books. We were just trying to find something to do on a Saturday afternoon, and the librarians there were fantastic, and they had a guy in the community that was a, about a 18-year-old kid, and he dressed up like Polar Man. He was called Polar Man, and he had a mask, and he had a cape, and he would be at the library. So my kids loved going to the library, and Polar Man would tell them stories. And so Polar Man was entertaining the kids one day, and I started pulling these books off. And I found a book that was about was called oh, Inuit Laws. And so the kids came over, and I said, let's look at this book. So we read this book on Inuit Laws, and it said things like, Pregnant women have to get up early in the morning before the rest of the family and get dressed and go, get completely dressed and go outside of the igloo and breathe the morning air. And that was it. There would be another law. Seal hunters must put snow in the mouth of the seal on every hit, on every kill. You can never blame the dog for farting. There were, next, next law. And so we read this book, we read this book over and over, and it just seemed like a kid's book. And then um, we went to the library, and they had an elder there. And the elder was going to tell stories at the library, and the stories were, they made Grimm's fairy tales look like Disney. They were really harsh stories of death and, and mystery and cutting people's body parts off and the, there were children all over the place and you know if it was sort of a if it was at the theater it would be an 18 and plus it wouldn't be pg okay and so there was all kids sitting there and i was like okay i'm experiencing something here that i don't quite understand and so I listened to the elders. I listened to them personify plants and animals. I listened to them talk about shape-shifting. I listened to them um, talk about how people were selected for leadership. It was so amazing. They had strong messages for children. Children were supposed to learn these messages. Children were supposed to hear these stories. They were supposed to take something from them. And I got curious. I read everything I could get my hands on. I went anywhere there were elders. I went everywhere there were elders because I was so thirsty for what is this knowledge. I began to read um, about traditional shamanic practices. I began to read about plants and relationships that we have with plants. I went back to my old family stories. When I was growing up, so I told you I come, my father comes from the Catepua Valley, and my, on my mother's side, my grandma was the first white baby born in the Red Fox Valley there, and so I'm very attached to the valley, the Capel Valley. And the Rougarou was the scary guy when I was growing up. Watch for the Rougarou. But as a kid, it's like, you know, your aunts and uncles are teasing you with, hey, don't you be going out there. It's dark out there. The is gonna get you out there. And I thought, what was that? What was that skill of old people being able to keep people in line, to keep children in line? And then I remembered, I was, I'm always so fascinated by Northern Lights. And so I remembered going out and wanting to be around the Northern Lights and I would be told, don't you whistle. Don't you be whistling when you go out to those Northern Lights. Those Northern Lights will come and they'll start talking to you and they can take your breath right out of your body. What? So, of course, kids have to go outside, and they dance. The northern lights dance, and you can see them dance, and you start to feel like you have this connection to them, and you have more power than you actually knew you had. 
And so I realized that I had actually grown up with some of these stories, but I didn't appreciate what I had grown up with. You start to listen and listen for a second time and a third time, and you start to realize that these legends have laws hiding in them. The elder tells the stories, and the t story seems fantastical, but when you actually listen, there's rules, lessons, and there's protocols. Who's involved? When are they involved? How does this unfold? There are guides to show humans the options they often have through lessons in the natural world. The songs of the Gitsan and the Wet'suwet'en are a tribute to the teachings and examples of how laws are found in them. One of the most profound, the leading case next to Chilcotin that just came down about what land meant and how Indigenous people are connected to land, of course, is the uh, Delgamuk decision. The Gitsan and Wet'suwet'en communities brought their stories, their songs, their masks into that arena for a judge to go, you will judge who we are based on this information. We're going to show you where we keep our laws. This was a huge, huge moment. If you're listening, agency is the underlying theme in many of these stories. The main character, if you will. Autonomy, choice, consequence are main themes. Natural consequence plays prominently and the elements, I'm talking about the actual elements, nature itself will always have a lead role. So these songs and stories, the sacred ones, are the places where our order has been kept to assist humans in remembering. In a non-Indigenous context, when you hear these, when this isn't a familiar thing for you, you would place little value on stories and songs and dances, even on Indigenous ceremony. Uh, don't they worship animals in there? What are they doing in there? They're not appreciated as anything more than cultural art at best, but they are truly more than that. They are the place. They are the placeholders where we keep our information. Creation stories, for example, are very, very particular to every and each nation. Some people come from the stars, and their creation stories are directly related to the stars. If you go talk to the Blackfoot, they're going to tell you about being the star people. If you talk to the, uh, the Woodland Cree, they're going to talk to you about being actually formed from the dirt, from the clay, from the earth. Most creation stories speak of the work of plant and animal kingdom, the contract that they had with the great mystery to support human life once it was created on Earth. One of my teachers, my, one of my closest teachers, is a woman named Gladys Wapas Grey Eyes. And she's taught with me at the College of Agriculture. She's taught with me at the law school. Uh, she, she is one of my closest, closest teachers. And she taught my students that there are four cycles of life. There's the, the first cycle being the elements, with the fire, rock, water, and wind, who agreed to be the basic essentials of life. And then came the four physical elements, the sun, the moon, Mother Earth, and the stars. Where would we get direction? How would we understand? She'll look up at this night sky. Now think about this next time you go outside. And she'll say, do you see that cluster right there? Let me tell you a little story about that cluster. And she'll tell you about what happened with Osaki Jack and his brother and how the father caught them, caught the mother with some snakes and how he cut her head off and her head went rolling. And he grabbed her by the foot and he swung her in the air. And now if you look, at the North Star and the Big Dipper, they're still up there. And as he was swinging her in the air, they went higher and higher and higher. And they're still going higher and higher and higher. Now, how does my friend Gladys from Thunderchild know that the stars are moving away from the Earth? There might be some laws in there. There might be some laws of physics in there. There might be some things that we could understand from those stories. The next, the next circle of life, she'll talk about the plant life. 
She'll teach you about the four sacred grasses who actually agreed to come and speak for us in the spirit world. And then she'll talk to you about the animal kingdom. Gladys also teaches people about where to find laws. We're often told that we're losing. And she'll say, the laws are always going to be available to us. That was the deal. Creation will offer the laws to us at any, at any time. And so she'll say, these women were talking about, well, I've got to get a sitter, and I've got to do this, and I've got to do that, and no, the kid's dad's not here and not helping with whatever. And she said, do you want to know what? These single mothers, I'm going to talk to them, and I'm going to take them outside. I'm going to tell them, we're going to go watch the deer. Because we, we were up at um, uh, Kendredine Campus, up by Christopher Lake. We're going to go watch these deer. Because they've been single parenting for an awfully long time. And they're going to teach us something. And if we want to know what our strength is and we want to know how to do this, there is always going to be a natural law that will tell us what that looks like. And then I had her up there with a PhD teaching the students about how to measure how high, this was an agriculture class, it was an indigenous resource management class, and so we're going to measure how high those trees are, we're going to measure how old those trees are, we're going to talk about this tree stand and what's involved in this tree stand and all the vegetation that grows up underneath it. She was absolutely fascinated by this. And so she hung out with this scientist all day and the students, and these are all um, land managers from across Canada. And they came over to talk with her. And, uh, and then it was evening, and we were having a fire. And uh, it was August. It was like the third week of August. And she said, did you see that? There's a firefly. And I said, no, I didn't see that. Oh, I saw that. Did anybody else see that? So we started looking. Sure enough, the fireflies are showing up. She said, Marilyn, I knew if I agreed to come and teach for you, I wouldn't get to pick my medicines. And I said, what? And she said, I have given up my winter medicines now because the fireflies are here. So the scientist that's sitting beside her at the fire said, I don't get it. What do fireflies have to do with it? And she said, I have a contract with those fireflies. I have a contract that I won't pick more than I need. And as soon as they show up, I stop picking because they need it. That's a contract I have with those fireflies. Do you have a contract with the fireflies? <laughs> and he said, I don't think so. And so if we think about that relationship, well, let's talk about participation and relationship and nation building and what that looks like. <clears throat> I have many elders that teach with me at the university. And I'm, I need to wrap up here so that we can have a, a longer discussion together. But um, one of the things that they talk about in terms of traditional law is that We've got laws that are spiritual laws, we've got laws that are natural laws, and we've got man-made laws or human-made laws. And that the human-made laws are often laid on over top. And they can be dismissed at any time from a spiritual or a natural law because, because those ones aren't changeable. We have no control over those. And when you hear about a tsunami and you hear about a hurricane and you hear about natural disaster, you'll understand natural law. When you go for a walk with one of my elders, Gladys's sister, Alma, was also one of my teachers, and she's passed on now. But you see one of those little tiny Johnny jump up plants, you know, those little tiny purple yellow plants. And you're walking on a city street, and the sidewalks are going like this, going like this, and being pushed completely out of the ground. And this little wee tiny flower pops out. And she says, natural law. So how strong is nature? I want to I wanna just end on where you're going to find some of these, because I want you to see that you're actually starting to be familiarized with some of them. And I'm going to use the Truth and Reconciliation Report as a place that you can find some of this information. So Murray Sinclair, who's actually speaking here tonight and is a magnificent, amazing speaker, and I encourage you all to go. He's such a good storyteller. He's going to talk to you about the seven grandfathers. And he's got a great little mnemonic to remember what the seven grandfathers are. Harry had, Harvey had red caribou with the ladies. Humility, honesty, respect, courage, wisdom, truth, and love. Imagine those being part of a legal system. The seven grandfathers, their teachings, they're attached to the animal world, they're attached to direction, 
They're very complex, but at their most simple form, humility, honesty, respect, courage, wisdom, truth, and love. The seven generations will look forward for seven generations to make decisions. Seven clans, and if you look at the rules and laws around the seven clans, they change depending on what territory you're in and what animal and plant kingdom are around those particular people. Seven holes in your head. I've just learned this one and I love it, that there's seven holes in your head. So you have two ears, two eyes, two nose holes and one mouth. And Gladys will tell you, if you are around her and talking and talking, she'll say, as far as I know, Creator gave you two eyes and two ears and only one mouth, so you should be listening and watching twice as much as you're talking. <laughs> and so the rule of seven. Uh, seven directions. We talk about four directions and we talk about the number four and four is definitely, the Cree are the Nehiao people, four, Nehiao is, not, is related to the number four. And we talk about four directions. But spiritually, you've got your left, your right, you've got above you, you've got below you, you have in front of you, you have behind you, and you have inside. So when you see an elder pray, you're going to see them pray in seven directions. Thirteen moons are related directly to the 13 markings on the back of a turtle for Turtle Island. The 28 days between the moons and the relationship to the women's cycle and ultimately to creation are also all laws. Four seasons, four parts of a plant, four phases of time, four levels of communication, four laws of treaty, which are very similar to the four cycles that I mentioned earlier. Um, what would it look like if we put all these together? What would it look like if we started to look at what our traditional governance models are and bringing them forward? There are, there are things that we actually in English now call societies that are traditional societies. There are traditional warrior societies, medicine societies, traditional um, dog soldier societies. There are traditional societies that are for um, you go backwards. Um, contraries. There's a contrary society. There's an actual role and laws and teachings that come from contraries. They're supposed to be here. And when you go to a powwow, if you see somebody dancing backwards to everybody else, they're the contrary. That's their role. They belong to a society. And those societies still exist. We think this is all gone away. We think we've lost those networks. We think we've lost those lodges and laws, but we have not. The elders that I work with are often part of secret lodges, lodges that have gone underground and that you earn, you earn levels of acceptance in. You earn rights. And one of the harshest, most harshest teachings I ever had was working with 12 elders one time at FSIN and reviewing some materials that were prepared from interviewing elders. And I started just saying them out loud. And there were teachings in there that I had never earned the right to speak about. And so my pen went down, my book got closed, and I had a whole day of teaching about how you earn the right to some of this stuff because every single law in our traditional methodologies are attached to responsibility. I think I'm gonna end it there. I think I've given you enough to think about in terms of it's still out there, it's very viable. We have definitely got something to say about nation to nation, partnership building, relationship building, and that it needs to be an inclusion from our very old to our very young that the women have something to bring, the men have something to bring, two-spirited people have something to bring, and that I think it could be a really great partnership. And that I know that there's another side to it. I've been working in the criminal law field since I was 18 years old. I definitely know, I've, I've, I know what the dark side of our life looks like, but we can't keep showing our children that. We have to start talking about where there's hope and where there's prosperity and where our traditions are gonna bring something. So, You've been very, very patient. Thank you so much for listening for uh, 10 minutes longer than you needed to. And I would love for any questions if anybody wants to talk about experiences or stories they have or 
questions? Let's just thank Marilyn for that first. <laughs>